Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club podcast. Join Eva Segaloff, Craig Underhill and Hans Prenham as they chat through the latest papers. This week, they discuss no-go, slow-go, go-go and essential medicines access. They also ask, do steroids matter? Quick Bites are as diverse as ever, covering doctor strikes in Nigeria, sex and toxicity in colorectal cancer, and much more. You'll also find out why you should never feel sorry for Hans again, despite the fact that he wants a colonoscopy for his birthday. So join us for the most relaxed and amusing oncology podcast. Reach out to us on Twitter using hashtag OJC. You'll find links to all of the papers, bios and Twitter handles in the notes on our website. For regular news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter on oncologynews.com.au. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. This is Rachel Bavin and this is the Oncology Podcast. G'day, g'day, g'day. Post Esmo, we're back into our regular hashtag OJC potties. Hello, Hans. Hi, Eva. How's your hand, Hans? <laughs> it's slightly improving. Oh, okay. Well, you take care there. I had feedback today from a listener who thought Hans' man hand operation was A, funny, B, a bit sad. This was from a female listener. And she's like, what? So Hans takes a week off. Eva cooks dinner the next night for the family. <laughs> yes, we'll start a crowdfunding for poor old Hans. But- yeah, I actually also got a lot of feedback for this. Some people that uh, asked me, how is your hand doing? Then I know they listen to the podcast. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's your mother. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so... Hans, you were saying COVID is almost over, over there. Yeah, since the 1st of October, everything changed here because we rarely see COVID still in the hospitals or intensive care, and only the ones that are unvaccinated get to intensive care. So we're opening society again because we have a vaccination level above, let's say, 95% of people over 12 years old in Flanders. Wow. And uh, no masks? We only use masks in hospitals still and on public transport and when you go to the hairdresser. So if you have contact professions, then they advise to do it. And But not in shops, not in the streets, uh, nowhere we don't use it anymore. How's the French part of Belton going? Huh? The French are a bit worse because there, especially in Brussels, a lot of people refuse the vaccine. And there they have different measures. So they still have to use their masks on more places than in the Flanders. So there is a difference. And our problem is our governments are insisting on using 80% of over 16s as the benchmark, which, of course, no one else in the world has done. No, it's not enough because they calculated now that should go, you should go over 90% or even more. So. And that's got to be 12 plus. So, you know, Melbourne's just reached the record of being the longest city in lockdown and people are really fatigued and I'm worried that we're going to, give up the ghost with, you know, just a short way to the finish line and go down the rabbit hole of bad COVID. But they are talking about opening up our borders, hands, and so that got me a bit excited. So I picked some global articles to discuss. Give us your first one then. I will. So this is an article co-authored by our friend Bish Gawali. He's not paying us, but we should ask him. And senior author Christopher Booth. And I've got one of Chris's editorials coming up as well. The paper is Access to Cancer Medicines Deemed Essential by Oncologists in 82 Countries, an International Cross-Sectional Survey. So do you know what the WHO EML list is, Hans? I know what WHO is, but not this list. <laughs> yeah. See, that's why you, you, you're on the podcast. You learn so much. So this is what's called the Essential Medicines List, and it identifies priority medicines most important to public health. And it's for all types of healthcare, but over time, there's increasing number of cancer medicines. 
So what they did was a cross-sectional survey that went to a whole global network of oncologists between October and December last year. You had to be a fully qualified physician who prescribed anti-cancer therapy, systemic anti-cancer therapy to adults to participate. And the primary question was asking the respondents to select the 10 cancer medicines that would provide the greatest public health benefit to their country. And then there were some other questions about uh, availability and cost. So the survey was answered by about 17% of participants. It was distributed to in both low and middle income countries and 65% of people in high income countries. So do you want to comment what that means to you, Craig? In terms of what I know? <laughs> Craig was shopping. So what, do you, what does that mean to you, Hans? I was shopping as well. I was reading my next paper that I'm about to present. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah. Sorry, ask me the question yet. Ask me the question again. I did read your paper last night. The response rate was 17% of uh, people that were uh, sent the survey in low income countries and 17% in middle income and 65% in high income countries responded. So what does that tell you? I think that's probably respondents versus despondents. Could be. Or hands, what did you say? They don't have email. They don't have email or they don't have time. It's interesting though, isn't it? Another population, did they, they send it around in English? They sent it to, I don't know, but they sent it through all the nodes like the different cancer societies and the different hospitals and regional associations. Anyway, all right, I've got, uh, I'll ask you another question. Give me some of the top 10 most commonly selected cancer medicines. So these are the ones that are going to give you the most importance to public health. Tamoxifen? No. I have five of them here. Uh, and tamoxifen's not on it. Pembrolizumab, thank you. Which would be controversial for the middle and lower income countries. And, uh, imatinib? No. 5-FU? Again, yes, 5-FU. And Good. not taxines, but taxel or docetax. Adriamycin? No. Yes, doxorubicin, of course, and oh, actually Packley is there. So cisplatin okay. and Packley, Packley, sorry. So You need cisplatin there to cure the germ cells and to give with radiotherapy. Correct. So 60% of them were cytotoxics and 65% of them had been granted FDA approval before the year 2000. So these are the very old drugs. Maybe that's to do with price and being off patent. Now, the universal availability of each of these top 20 cancer medications range from 9 to 54% in low and middle income countries and 68 to 94% in high income countries. So it's a really interesting paper, I think. The conclusion is that there are major barriers to access to core cancer medicines worldwide. It poses a dilemma of adding additional expensive medicines and there's a need for global policy. But it's a good exercise. What 20 drugs, can anti-cancer drugs, do you think are the most important? Uh, and interesting that Pembro is uh, one of the few new drugs in terms not just of cost, but efficacy. Yeah, but if you see in melanoma, we had no options there since there are, because chemotherapy doesn't work. And what you see now with immune therapy, we live very long with immune therapy there. Yeah, great. So there you go. Global, global. Over to you, Hans. I actually also selected a very interesting paper. It's, it's a question I have already for a couple of years and I hoped it to be answered, but do steroids matter? This was a review of pre-medication for taxane chemotherapy and hypersensitivity reactions. It's recently published in GCO, August 2021, by the group of Stanford. And the reason I selected this one is because, as you know, there's a huge variation in prescribing practices for steroids 
as pre medication worldwide. And actually, when I moved from Leuven to Antwerp, suddenly I saw okay, they also give dexamethasone as pre medication, but if you don't have a reaction, after a couple of administrations, they just stop the steroids. And this is something which is a bit, yeah, not logic to me because you expect, okay, you avoid the hypersensitivity. It works because you didn't get hypersensitivity, so you have to continue the steroids. But still, they do it differently everywhere. So what these authors did is they looked into a retrospective cohort of more than 3,000 patients. And of these 3,000 patients, around 8% had a hypersensitivity reaction. I think it's quite high because it's not what I see in, in practice, but still. And the good thing is that they were unable to demonstrate an association between the dexamethasone dose and the rate of hypersensitivity reactions. Because as you know, a lot of people give 20 milligram, especially sometimes in the evening, and this is impossible to sleep. And I try to change this in my practice to 10 milligram, but still a lot of oncologists are refusing and still continue with 20. But I think this paper now shows that maybe we can decrease the dose to 10 milligram, which is preferable to minimize both the hypersensitivity reactions and also the steroid side effects. The only weird thing is that they show a higher rate of hypersensitivity in females and patients with gynecological cancers. But I don't know if it's due to the fact that they give a lot of taxanes there, whether there's a real relationship there. But maybe it's it's a good thing to discuss how you do it in practice, Craig and Eva. Yes. So, Craig, are you actually with us today answering any questions? Yes, I, I am. I was, I was going to answer, but I could see you were about to. I didn't want to talk over the top of you like I normally do, but I will go now. So, Hans, I think they do matter. So, as a research fellow, uh, I was involved in a phase one and then a phase two study of taxanes in ovarian cancer. And initially, actually, we were concerned that it wasn't a deliverable drug because of the reaction. So there's no doubt that the addition of steroid premedication for paclitaxel saved the development of the drug. But yes, it's a really interesting question then. What, what's the right dose? And so... It'd be interesting to delve into the detail, but my general practice in a nutshell would be to follow the current EVQ guidelines. So, you know, eviq.org.au is kind of the reference website in Australia for how to handle dose modifications. And I think it's just important that everyone's going to have difference in practice, but for the sake of consistency across the department and institution with nursing staff, I would just follow a set of guidelines and Eva's nodding at all. We've been trying to get them to change the really high doses and one of the problems is that if you don't have further data published, those guidelines stick to the published data and they're super high doses. It's like, you know, especially for three days after dose attacks or et cetera. And these cause significant side effects. So over the years I give less and less steroid and I think it's really helpful to have data. Also, the weird thing is, let's say you use carboplatin plus paclitaxel for esophageal cancer. They give a different pre-dose and when you use the same schedule for, let's say, ovarian cancer. So this doesn't make any sense. So that's why I'm fighting quite hard to get the dose down to, let's say, 10 milligram. It's already a sufficient dose because 20 milligram dexamethasone in the evening, it's terrible. Yeah, it's huge, isn't it? And the women we know, say, for adjuvant breast cancer, all put on weight, or many, many of them do, and it's probably the dexamethasone. But I do agree with Craig, a standardised approach, but uh, reversion to the original data is the default if we have no further data. So good paper hands. All right, Craig, your turn. Thanks, Eva. So a big shout out to the hematologists who called me to say how much they were enjoying the podcast. And they remember the throwaway line in one of the episodes was like, are there any hematologists out there? So there are hematologists who do listen to the podcast and that they asked that we do more hematology content. So I thought it'd be controversial because I haven't run this past the boss, but I'm going to do a hematology paper right now. And this is from Blood. They're looking shocked. 
This is live radio, live podcast. Okay, so you need to get at least 10 people contacting us saying they enjoyed the Heme paper. No problem, I'll okay. do that. Yep. Unsolicited, unsolicited. So if you want to save Craig's ass, <laughs> unsolicited, <laughs> tell us you liked his blood paper. Okay, so this is a, was a plenary paper in blood, recent edition. A genetic identification of patients with AML older than 60 years achieving long-term survival with intensive chemotherapy. This is from French group, so it's got to be good, right? So what they did is they wanted to develop a way to stratify patients according to risk that was reproducible and would have a clinically meaningful impact. So elderly AML is an increasing problem globally and, you know, even more so in first world countries or high income countries with the aging population. And we'll see it in other situations as well. So what they did was they looked at Patients with AML over 60 years who were treated with what's called 7 plus 3 regimen, standard regimen. They sequenced 37 genes, was from the ALFA 1200, the Acute Leukemia French Association study. They looked at mutation patterns and overall survival, which differed across uh, the patient groups that were already stratified into cytogenic risk. So they were looking at mutations as well as the cytogenetics. And basically what they were able to do is quite eloquent. They were able to stratify these patients into three risk groups, which they called the no-go group, the slow-go group, or the go-go group. Oh, that paper, that wins just for that. (laughs) The go-go group. So the the, The um, no-go group. And this is quite, their term's quite, used by our geriatric oncologists and geriatric colleagues, right? What if you mishear it and they say no-go and you think go-go? I thought you said go-go. No, I said no-go. So they basically used an algorithm with just the cytogenetic risk and they they came down to in a Cox multivariate analysis to seven genes uh, that were analysed by NGS. So, and they were the the NPM1 mutation, the FLT3 ITD low ratio, the FLT3 ITD high ratio, NRAS, AXL1, and DNMT3A, plus KRAS and TP53. So, seven genes, five of them are a non-poor risk cytogenetics and the other two are poor risk cytogenetics. So seven genes can be used to basically stratify into three groups with quite distinct, distinctly separated survival differences. They then did three independent validation cohorts to show the validity and the, the simpleness, the robustness and the discriminant prognostic model for AML patients over 60. So basically they're saying for the no-go patients, which was 11% in the independent validation, they probably shouldn't receive active treatment. 31% were in the go-go group and 37% intermediate group. And the survival advantage, as I said, is quite distinct differences in overall survival with these patients. So they're saying now that they'll use that to stratify future studies. This is important now in the design of future studies looking at either intensification or de-intensification regimens. So I think the learnings for other tumours outside of the solid tumours is, again, uh, the importance of that uh, molecular analysis and the NGS in in enriched populations and determine treatments. I asked one of our hematologists what he thought, and he thought, yeah, it was a really good paper, that at the moment the cost of doing the NGS test is about $800. It's not funded through the MBS, so institutions have to pay or patients are out of pocket. And, you know, that's when you think about it, that's a pretty dumb way to manage things. If you pick out the patients who shouldn't have treatment through this process, you're going to save way more than $800 and all the heartache side effects of the treatment for no benefit. So... I think it's instructive that we, you know, we need to fund these testing. We need more studies using this kind of process to look at 
how we can best choose in our elderly and non-elderly solar tumour patients, you know, how, how we should move forward. That's it. Great. Any comments? I can see you've written speed up in the chat. <laughs> No, that was interesting, Craig. Thank you. And thanks for bringing hematology. Don't forget, he needs 10 votes to stay on or he'll be kicked out of the Big Brother house. All righty. So short bites. Now, I've got one on my um, global theme. It's called Lung Cancer in Belgium, published in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology. I mean, what an original Thing. Let's just do lung cancer in every country and your, your publication record will go through the roof. So the interesting thing, I'm not going to talk at all about lung cancer, but it was just describing the healthcare system. So just so that none of our listeners ever feel sorry for hands again, it starts off saying the density of healthcare resources in Belgium is high. So if you're 11.5 million population, it's got 35,000 acute care beds in 128 hospitals, seven linked to a university. They're all linked into 25 loco regional networks. They have a national electronic health database and it's all the same one in every hospital, which is a stunningly clever thing that Australia was not able to institute. And they say that platform's linked to the Social Security Data Warehouse. And also they have multidisciplinary tumour boards and oncology care programs, which came from two royal decrees. So we forget that you have a king and queen as well. And they have a Belgium cancer registry. So why do you always complain, Hans? I think they presented much, much, much better than it is because they never mentioned how recent the data have to be. So if you need data, it's, I think, they're updated until, let's say, 10 years ago or something like this. So it's, in theory, it should all work nicely, et cetera, et cetera. But they collect data nationally, that's true. But still, in every hospital, we have a different patient system or patient file system, which makes it very difficult to communicate with each other. So a lot of Exams are repeated because we can have not have access to the other uh, system from the other hospital, let's say. Ah, well, they implied they were all the same, so maybe you need to write a letter to the editor. Maybe anyway, I will do that. <laughs> so on the other hand, I have uh, an article from Lancet Oncology News called Cancer Care Crisis in Nigeria Amid Doctors' Strike. And this was published September 23, saying the provision of cancer care in Nigeria is entering a crucial phase as thousands of resident doctors remain on strike due to unpaid salaries, inadequate facilities and other reasons. So, you know, we live in a global world. The pandemic has brought that home if it wasn't already. And I think it's super interesting to think about cancer care in other countries, both the very rich countries like Belgium and the very poor countries like Nigeria. I thought you were going to say Australia. No, no. I had to review an interesting paper for JCA Global. On the same lines, Eva, it's amazing that we're sort of stuck in our first world places, but there's some sad situations out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And all sorts of pressures like brain drain, you know, so how do you manage to retain staff, Mm. let alone train them up? Yeah, that's right. Did you see a response to COVID surge is going to be to import hundreds of healthcare workers from overseas? And we know where they come from. We ca- they come from the countries that most need them. Right, I've got one more global short bite, and this was published in the New England in September 2021, and it's called New Creatinine and Cystatin C-Based Equations to Estimate GFR Without Race. And it was published by a number of authors on behalf of the Chronic Kidney Disease Epidemiology Collaboration. So did you know that the current equations that estimate GFR using either serum creatinine or cystatin 
C, incorporate age, sex, and race. And as they point out, race in EGFR equations is a social and not a biological construct. So they had some development data sets of around 8,000 patients, of which a third were black, and then they had some validation data sets. And basically they've rejigged the equation because the equation was a poor fit for blacks and they say a lesser degree non-blacks, that's their wording, but they say they've produced some new equations that do not have race factored in. So here we are in 2021. I thought that was really interesting. I think it's super interesting. I don't think that we ever used race as a marker there to calculate EJVAR. It's inherent in the equation. So that's mine done. Hands. Yes, actually I have a couple of them. Maybe I will start with three papers about early onset colon carcinoma. They were published almost together. So what is early onset colon carcinoma? It means when you get colon cancer at the age, let's say somewhere between 20 and 49, so when you're still young. And as you know, there is a rising early onset colon cancer incidence. And a first paper looked in uh, gastroenterology, September 2021, whether it's an artifact by increased screening And they looked in a 21-year study period and they confirmed that it's not an artifact, that it's actually on the rise. And therefore, it's it's also often diagnosed at an advanced stage. So they claim that maybe you should start screening at the age of 45 instead of 50, for example. Two other papers then looked at what are the molecular differences or maybe the clinical difference between this early onset colon carcinoma and let's say the normal onset carcinoma. The first paper was published in GNCI, August 2021. It's from the Accent database. As you know, the Accent database is a large database of uh, all from adjuvant studies. And this database has more than 35,000 subjects, in this case with stage 3 colon cancer. And what they see is that in early onset colon cancer, you have a higher rate of Lynch syndrome, which is not a surprise. But actually, it was more the tumor biology that was prognostic than the age of onset. So they claim that it's similar biologically. And this was confirmed by another paper in GNCI uh, in the same issue, looked at clinical and genomic differences. And they looked, uh, I think, 759 patients with early onset versus 687 with average onset. And then they claimed that early onset was more common left-sided, present with rectal bleeding, but they are genomically, clinically the same as average onset. So conclusion is we still don't know why this early onset colon carcinoma is on the rise and they are genomically, clinically uh, the same. Hans, now be honest. I think you've presented those papers before. You're just recycling because you're too lazy to do new papers. Actually, Eva, I know you have a very good memory, but in this case, it's true that we discussed before about early onset colon cancer, but these were other papers that looked mainly whether we see it more in Western countries versus, let's say, more poor countries to stay in the global field. And another paper looked at whether there is a real increase, yes or no, because some claim there isn't, some claim there is, but I think the data is clear out now there that there is an increase in early onset colon cancer. We have to accept it. It's a bit like climate change where some people claim it's not there, and I think it's there. Okay, but it is true that we have talked before that the American Cancer Society has lowered the age of screening to 45. We're still at 50 in Australia. We too. Yeah, no, no, we too at at 50. But then I'm doubting because maybe I can tell this already on the podcast, but 29th of October is my birthday and I will become 45. So I wonder whether I should ask maybe a colonoscopy for my birthday this year. I thought you were going to say you were 50. <laughs> you should do a Japanese style, Hans. Yeah. So what's Japanese style? Japanese Remember, style of colonoscopy. Self colonoscopy. Ah, self okay, okay, okay. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a try. Okay. okay but... That'll keep you occupied. Yes, continue. Okay. One short bite is about it's a Belgian study, so that's why I have to present it here. It's published in Clinical Corrector Cancer called Sex and Regraphnip Toxicity. 
they found that there was both grade 2 and grade 3 more toxicity in females. 84% versus 60 and 71 versus 53. So it's, it's there. And mainly fatigue, anorexia, hypertension, that were, and rash were more reported in females. So maybe we have to take this into account in future studies that toxicities can be different. So hands... I had to judge the posters at ESMO last year for neuroendocrine. I gave the prize to one describing exactly that for neuroendocrines with sunitinib. I will continue on to my last short bite of today. It's the association between effectiveness of first-line treatment and second-line treatment in gastroesophageal cancer. It's an interesting one because I didn't know, but it's by a group of the Netherlands published in European Journal of Cancer, October 2021. And they show a positive correlation between the effectiveness of first line and the outcome of second line, which means if your first line works well and long, there is a higher chance that your second line will work. And maybe it's something that we have to take into account before deciding a second line treatment, depending on the effect of the first line. It's something that I didn't really do in practice, but maybe it's something we should do. But weren't you always taught that if you respond better to first line you have a higher chance of response to second and third. It doesn't really make biological sense if they're different agents, does it? But it's certainly the sort of dominant paradigm. Yeah, indeed. It's it's true, but sometimes we have to be reminded that we have to think, okay, but sometimes first line is not working, second line, and we give a third line. Maybe we should not do that, give the third line in this setting. Third. Third. Go for it, Craig. Three quick bites. First one from Lakati et al. and JCO Phase 2 study of abiraterone acetate in patients with castrate-resistant androgen receptor expressing not prostate cancer but salivary gland cancers. So these are rare cancers. So it's known that a large proportion of them express androgen receptors and HER2. So they're often treated like breast cancers with androgen deprivation plus or minus testuzumab if you're in a country that can afford it. And second line, when they're castrate resistant, what do we do? So this was a phase two, like in prostate cancer, giving abiraterone, and it had a good response rate in a single institution phase two study. So the response rate was 21%. How many patients? 24. So, you know, it's it would need further study, but interesting paper. If anyone who treats head and neck cancer and they can pop up in their MDT and whip that out. So this is a paper from Devra Condi et al. Genomic Profiling of Lung Adenocarcinoma in Never Smokers. So they looked at the presence of actionable driver mutations in never smokers versus smokers and also looked at their uh, germline alterations from a pre-existing database uh, cancer genome atlas and clinical proteonomic tumor analysis consortium. They were looking for whether there was a difference between smokers and never smokers and we know that there seems to be anecdotally more actionable mutations in the never smokers. So they actually confirmed that so the difference was 78 to 92% versus 49%. So th- there was a high number of actionable mutations in the never smokers, when about half of the smokers had an actionable mutation. This highlights the importance of why we need to be doing these tests really in all patients with lung cancer so we don't miss them. Then they looked at the comparison of germline variants, and it was the same in both groups. So there's no difference in smokers and non-smokers whether they have a germline mutation that affects their gene mutation repair. They did see, though, that there was in the never smokers, about 6% of them had a genomic pattern that is associated with passive exposure of cigarette smoke. So, you know, often you get never smokers saying, oh, it's because I married a smoker. Well, on this basis, there's a, there is a small number associated with passive smoking. So, as I said, reiterating the importance, I think, of doing the genomic testing in all of the tumours in adenocarcinoma of the lung because there are a high number of actionable mutations now found. And then the third paper is a new PD-1 antibody called Dastalimab, and this was from the Garnett study, which was a study in patients with mismatch repair genes across solid tumours. So we know that in Australia we have pembrolizumab for mismatch repair colon cancers and FDA in the US has approved it as a tumor agnostic drug 
So in any patients from any tumour that have the mismatch repair gene, this was from a study looking at exactly that. So that had a uh, what you'd expect about a 45 to 50% response rate, which I think is what we see in patients with mismatch repair genes in colon cancer. So that's now had accelerated approval in the US. And interestingly, we talk about the ability to do the test. So concurrently, they prove the, the uh, diagnostic platform that tests for the mismatch repair genes. Fascinating, huh? Yeah, the, and the big question will be whether the competition will drive the price down. Yeah, so we've been pretty global today, pretty chilled, pretty honest. Uh, that's us. That's OJC. So it's over and out. Bye for now, hands. Hang on, hang on, Eva. Eva, before we sign off, what about your amazing article of the week? Oh, look, I was going to be kind to Hans and not do it. But speaking with uh, the global theme, this is an article actually from that wonderful scientific journal, The Guardian, called Better Ugly Than Boring. Book celebrates bizarre Belgian houses. So it's a book which features all sorts of weird and wonderful houses called Visual chaos. It started off as a blog, Ugly Belgian Houses. Then it became uh, More Ugly Belgian Houses. Uh, Now it's a book. So Hans, is your house in there? My house is not in there, (laughs) but actually it's quite a famous book. I think it's already uh, second or third edition. I don't know because they call it Ugly Houses, but they're quite special. You can click on the links if you want to see more. So another great episode in the can, Eva. Well done. Well done, Hans. All righty. See you later. Bye, everyone. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.